Hi, long-time viewers will recognise this board. This is a magnetic core memory from about 1970. And I did a video on this eight years ago looking at this. It was original in mailbag one, but then I spun the video out onto my second channel. And it was very popular. And magnetic core memory was the standard type of uh, memory from probably the mid-50s through to like the mid-70s, sort of late 70s still being used even still being used into the 80s, but they weren't manufacturing it back then. And this board stores a whopping 400 words of 64-bit. So there's actually a um, hundred by 64 tiny little ferrite rings in there, and each ferrite ring stores one bit of information. And it's double-sided. Look at that. <laughs> Fantastic. So this is how memory modules were uh, up until like the mid 70s. They use magnetic core memory. Let me show you this up close. So I have to get the macro lens out. So in addition to some very poor solder joints there, <laughs> that's terrible mural. Here are the individual ferrite rings. And hopefully you can see those and you can see that there's uh, actually three wires running through each little ferrite uh, toroidal ring there. And one is the X wire, one is the Y wire, so on a regular XY grid. And the third wire is the sense wire, and that's how you can read data back out of these. And I'll shift my focus up there to the top of the screen and back down to the bottom. Sorry, it's really hard to get these things in focus all the time. And it's better if I show you how this works by uh, going to the videotape. Let's go. So to show you how this uh, actually works, I found this really cool, the National Mag Lab, they've got a really cool um, like simulator animation kind of thing. The National Mag Lab is funded by the National Science Foundation, the state of Florida. Thank you very much, Floridians, um, for this. Um, excellent. So this tutorial illustrates how magnetic core memory works. It set up took a little bit like chocolate donuts strung on a chain link fence. The donut shapes are ferrite cores. Ferrite is a ceramic made primarily of iron oxide that can easily be magnified, magnetized or demagnetized. I'm not sure if they ever used any secret sauce in them. I don't think they had to, really. Um, it was, you know, just basic iron oxide type stuff. And of course, you can just permanently magnetize iron and then you can demagnetize it um, as well, just like you can magnetize your screwdriver and demagnetize it. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, set a value of one uh, in this bottom uh, left corner down here. It's currently set to a zero. So we have to put, um, so we have to select uh, this particular row here, obviously, X row and this particular Y uh, column here, of course. And then we put a pulse of uh, current through that. So if we set that value to one like this, then if we hit that, you'll see that it's put in, oh, and it's flipped it in the direction like that, it started going in the, like your magnetic rule of thumb, you remember that? So it was going in one direction and then it flipped it in the other. So the original value was zero and changed it to a one. So let's actually, so we've stored a one in the magnetic field in that ferrite ring. So let's say we wanted to set the value back to one because we just read it out, which can be destructive. So we want to read it back in. So we'll set it to one again and let's click on that Again, you'll notice that it went in that direction and it didn't flip directions there. So it original value is one and it remains at one. And we can set that back to zero. You'll see it goes in that direction and then whoop, it flips in that direction. Cool, huh? So yeah, it's, you're effectively changing the magnetic field inside each individual ferrite ring. And because it's localized in the toroid, um, you can have that really um, high packing density that we're seeing here and they're not going to uh the field's not going to really bleed into the other ring because it's not going through the hole like that that's what she said okay so what we're going to do now is we're going to read a value uh we'll do the bottom uh left one again here but we've got a waveform of the sense line here so it's got zero volts in the middle and if and if we're getting a positive voltage on the sense line it'll go up if we get a negative voltage it'll go down so let's read back let's see what waveform we get when we read back a value of one shall we and remember when I said this is destructive memory, so we're going to actually kill that bit and we have to write it back. But if we've got a one in there, let's read it. Boom, it goes up, whoop, like that. And then, well, you saw that it actually uh, rewrote 
that bit back after reading. So basically we're writing in a zero and reading the sense line at the same time. The value was one, but it's now a zero. And then you had to restore. So you've read the value. You can process that, do whatever you want. Um, and then, but then you have to restore that value of one back. So let's now read a value that has a zero in it like this, okay? And you'll notice how it had the big hump before. It is no more big hump anymore because it was set to zero and the sense line read back the zero. Um, so basically nothing uh, changed. So value was zero and it remained zero. So only if there was a one in there, have you destroyed that value and then you'd have to write it back for the zeros, you actually get a freebie. So yeah, that can save some processing, some memory access time. So it is essentially random access time memory. I, it just occurred to me. So it's rat. It's rat memory. <laughs> random access time. Because you don't know whether it's a zero or one. And if it's a uh, one, then you have to actually spend the time writing that back. So you've got to have that extra process there, but you don't have to do that for a zero. So let's read that value again, but let's read it from this uh, one here, which has a one, this ring here, which has a one and boom, you get that. And then boop, you've got to write it back. So if you want to know how fast these memories were, well, it varies a lot, but uh, basically, you know, like a megahertz would be like a really quick uh, jobby. I don't know, leave it in the comments if you know of like quicker uh, core, magnetic core memories uh, like this. But yeah, I think, you know, upper limit, like a meg or two maybe. You can see that all those wires are like just individually hand <laughs> wired, hand soldered uh, through. And then they've got like big long sections like this that then just like the X wires just go uh, right through to the other section there. Um, it's rather remarkable. So this has a total of 3.2 kilobytes of memory or 25,600 bits spread over these four uh, separate areas on both sides there. Pretty impressive. And I can just, with my Mark I eyeball, uh, make out each little uh, individual uh, ferrite uh, ring, ferrite uh, toroid in there. But I was in the bunker the other day and look what I found. I don't think I've done a video on this and I don't remember where I got this from, obviously someone sent it to me, so thank you very much. Maybe it's in a mailbag somewhere. If you can find it, let me know, um, and I'll uh, link it in down below. But uh, this is an Ampex jobby, uh, jobby from Ampex uh, Memory Products Division. Um, Ampex, of course, you know, uh, make famously make, uh, you know, like invented uh, tape to tape uh, recorders and uh, you know stuff like that. But uh, they were into uh, computers and memory and stuff like that as well. This is their Memory Products Division, but. Watch this, if I take off the shield off it, whoa, look at the density of this thing. I'm not sure if you're seeing that on your 4K tellies, but um, yeah, I can sort of, you know, as I said, mark one eyeball, just make out each little ferrite ring there. There's no way I can do it on this one. This bad boy is uh, the on, on the label, it's a 16K. I don't know if that's 16K bytes or 16K words, I don't know. Um, so I haven't actually tried to count up the individual um, ferrite rings in here, but wow. Um, we're gonna need some serious magnification to look at this board. This is just, Incredible, and it is a single sided one, it's just got shielding on the bottom. And there's the driver chips, uh, 1976 date code, so yeah, that's uh, you know, mid 70s, sort of you know, that was back when they didn't get much more dense than this at the time. And you can see, look at all the individual bundles of wires, somebody had to, or some machine, I don't know, somebody had to wire these things. Look at the density of all this. Oh, it's just insane. So there you go, it's an Ampex model 1600, but I couldn't readily find any uh, info on this, um, but uh, five volts and uh, plus 15 volts, and it's got non-flight. So was this used in some sort of uh, like flight hardware, either space hardware or military hardware? If anyone recognizes this uh, tag, please leave it in the uh, comments down below. But you can say, see it's a 16K memory PCB. And of course, one of the good things about uh, ferrite core memory is that they're not susceptible 
to uh, you know any sort of you know cosmic radiation, nuclear blasts, and things like that. These things are going to be super duper reliable, and this probably still has all these decades later still has uh, whatever was programmed into these things because the uh, the magnetic field in those ferrites um, wouldn't uh, really dissipate very quickly. I don't know I, if you know how quickly these things dissipate, but I do believe it'd still be in there. But unfortunately, these are destructive uh, memories. So to read them out, you actually have to destroy the information, unfortunately, and then you've got to write it back. So if you don't have a mechanism to write it back reliably, reading it out is a one-shot deal. And you can just see them like wired in there and a bit, huge big board to board inner connects here. I don't know what it uh, goes off to, but, but these are obviously your uh, Y drivers. Probably, you know, <laughs> you probably won't find any data on those. And then those ones up the side here, these would be your X drivers like that. And so all that uh, circuitry up the top, that's um, probably the um, sense wires up there so that'd be a sensing so so you've got x and uh, y drivers here and that'd be uh, all the sensing up there that does the uh, readout okay i've got my macro lens and i won't adjust anything here is the old uh, board the 400 word one and i'm going to put in the 16k word board and see that is the density difference. <laughs> I didn't adjust anything. That is inside. Like, I can't even see the indiv ind individual ferrite rings on the camcorder screen. And if I zoom in any further, um, it's just going to, you know, it's just going to go out of focus, I think. Yep. Okay, I'm under the microscope. Unfortunately, this is only 1080p, so this will be um, upscaled uh, to 4K. But uh, this is the old board, of course. You can see how sparse they are. These uh, ferrite rings are not anywhere near each other. And you can see the green wires running diagonally. They're the sense lines uh, going diagonally through these. And then you've got the X running across this direction, of course, and then the Y running across here. So you really do need some sort of magnification to actually see like the individual ferrite uh, rings in here really. But anyway, I'll keep exactly the same uh, zoom level and let's go for the big daddy here. Let's go see if we can. In fact, it has problem. Focus in, focus you bastard. Come on, come on, you can do it. Focus. <laughs> that is the same zoom level. That is the same zoom level. Look at that. <laughs> That's nuts. These things are practically touching. Well, no, no, they're not actually touching, but, oh, no, that's got a lot of, geez, that's got a lot of dust. Let me go to a non-dusty area. There you have it. I've actually got to tilt this board a bit to try and keep the microscope from like not like unfocusing on this thing. But um, you can see that they're not quite touching. Right, so I have zoomed in a bit. They're not quite touching. My poker looks enormous. Um, but you can see that um, the green will be the sense line here. It's interesting that they've like joined those. Looks like they had that split and then they joined that. That's interesting, isn't it? Um, but yeah, they don't go diagonally anymore with the uh, sense line. The sense line is going vertically through vertically or horizontally, depending on which way you want to look at it. Um, and of course, you've got your regular horizontal lines going through. You've got your regular vertical lines. And then you've got your giant wire bundles up here. Look at this. This is just nutso. <laughs> Imagine trying to, like, cable loom that. That is just insane. Let's see if I can get in there a bit further. It's hard to get. That's as far as my Tagano microscope will go. So, yeah. Each one of those ferrite rings is one bit of memory. And as I said, they've probably still got the data actually stored in them. But to read them out, unfortunately, it will be destructive. So it's a one shot deal. But so to get this extra density, they've actually overlapped. The, they put them on an angle and overlapped those um, ferrite uh, rings there. That's just that's just crazy. And they're not touching because the wires will sort of like, you know, self um, separate them. But wow, wow, that is really something, is it not? So can you count up how many are in that grid? Yeah, these things are so small that the microscope like loses focus on, the, you know, the, the focus area, Just it, it just can't do it. It just can't do it. <laughs>
Anyway, there you go. That is one bank. So if you can count those, I, I should be able to count those. I will, I will count these in the edit and I'll um, overlay it on the screen. We've then got 80 banks minus, curiously, like why they just left this out, I don't know. Um, 80 banks, so there's 8 by 10 uh, high. So 80 minus 8, so they've got 72 banks there. So <laughs> 72 banks of uh, ferrite memory that's just that's crazy so yeah these are ampex so those are x and y uh drivers they're ampex jobbies like good luck trying to find i don't even think i'd bother um searching for those really yeah it looks like it's the same for both x and y is it yes yes the same jobby but those uh sense ones up the top as i said they would be the uh, sense lines. So, oh, they're a Fairchild job. You might be able to get those. 75234. Uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that fascinating look at magnetic core memory from the mid 50s through to, you know, early to mid 70s. Then they, they were still making them after that for legacy uh, systems, but nobody was seriously using them um, after, you know, it wouldn't be a choice after um, that once solid state memory. But they do have their advantages. They're extremely robust and uh, they're not susceptible to any, you know, cosmic rays and probably nuclear, um, you know, EMP pulses and all that um, sort of stuff. These are just absolutely fascinating. I reckon the magnetic information is, there's a good chance that is still in there if you wanted to read it out. So if you've got any clue um, where this thing was made, it's flight something. So it was used in some sort of flight hardware. Doesn't quite seem like it's built down to like size and weight for like a space-based uh, one really, but you never know. But anyway, the Ampex 1600. There you go. Um, <laughs> 16K. And um, yeah, I should be able to put up the total in bits here <laughs> once I count them in the edit. <laughs> anyway, if you like that video, please give it a big thumbs up. As always, discuss down below. Catch you next time.